We're joined by Greg Jacobson. Greg, how's it going? Good. I am really excited to be here. If you would have asked me two or three years ago, would we still be doing the Ask Us Anything series on episode 26? I would say certainly everyone has asked us everything that they could ever want to ask us, but obviously there's new people with new questions. Certainly there are themes, but it's always fresh, so I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, yeah, and we've got, I apologize to people who have submitted questions that we haven't gotten to yet. We've got a backlog of you know, probably another three or four hour uh, episodes. Maybe we need to do an hour long episode, but 30 minutes seems well, to be about right. Yeah. I think it's it's a perfect lunchtime kind of activity, so. Yeah, should we jump right in? I mean, sometimes we try to do a fun question, but I don't want to detract from the questions from our community, you know? Let's jump right in. Let's do it. All right. All right. So here's a question from Isabel. Can you provide guidance on how to determine performance indicators? I'm in the business of certification exams. Most of my work is focused on coaching groups to reduce process waste and create solutions to challenges. Um, I'm struggling to apply manufacturing indicators to my core business to totally see the relationship and its applicability, help, question mark. Or it's more of a, <laughs> so there's not an exclamation point, help. But um, let, me, let me share some thoughts first. I mean, I think, you know, I don't know if you call them manufacturing indicators, but when I started working in manufacturing, kind of the classic lean manufacturing indicators were SQDCM, safety, quality, delivery, cost, and morale. So. You know, somebody working in um, certification exams, maybe office ergonomics or safety is something that could be measured or worked on. Maybe that's not as big of a priority as it might be in manufacturing um, or healthcare, where I've found those metrics really translate well. But I, mean, I think the key is looking at your own business and, and thinking, what are the measures that matter? Um, there, there's a, a really popular book out there. Um, that might be helpful by John Doerr called Measure What Matters as a thought process of figuring out what matters to the organization and uh, what the measures should be. And, and final thought, I, mean, I think from a lean methodology perspective, the strategy deployment process walks you through a similar structure um, and, and trying to think of you know, uh, what, what, what matters, how do we measure it, and then if your organization is large enough, how do you cascade that throughout different parts of the organization. What, what, what are your thoughts, Greg? I mean, I think to me, I, the most important thing there is the K part, it's the key. So <laughs> what you're gonna do, I don't think this number is bigger than five or six. When you're talking about kind of vast majority of people in the organization having their eye on the ball. And so if you look at the, the KPIs of an emergency department, for instance, I don't, I don't think they're directly related to anything or they're, they're directly, um, they're exactly the same as anything in manufacturing. I think they're probably related and you probably would say, oh, well, you know, a, a door to triage time for a patient is kind of corollary to this in manufacturing or a door to doctor time or the number of times people don't get an EKG within 10 minutes of presenting with uh, chest pain. So there, there's going to be certainly whatever I think is, is deemed important for that organization. I would probably, if, if I was doing certifications, I probably would not look at manufacturing um, numbers at all because I think they would just confuse me because I wouldn't 100% understand what they are unless I was talking to someone in manufacturing and getting kind of a deep dive into what, what do these metrics really mean right. and then draw parallels to like, okay, what does that mean from a certification standpoint? Like, for example, does it mean the number of people that, you know, um, purchase a certification per month or the number of people that purchase but then take the certification or the, the time it takes for people to take a certification or the success rate of it? I, I don't really know if it's if this is online or in person, but certainly, certainly uh, there's going to be things that correlate but I think the the biggest and, and the biggest take home here is that it's key so for example in Kinexus at Kinexus and in Kinexus every single department or division usually refer to them as divisions has their own KPIs and there's about three to five uh -huh. uh, data points on each one of those and everyone has access to them and can see them at any point and um, I, I would 
like to think that everyone looks at them probably once a month or so and just kind of sees where they're at. Yeah, and uh, you, you make some really good points there. Um, like manufacturing, uh, on-time delivery rate or percentage is a really important measure. Um, in healthcare, you might look at something more like um, you know, the average delay between scheduled appointment time and the time actually seen or some other way of looking at flow. Um, you know, for certification business, you know, you might not find a direct parallel there, but you might try to think of, well, what, what are the quality metrics? Um, are, are there defects in the process that prevent somebody from signing up when they're intending to? Um, so I think, yeah, you have to think through what matters to you. I, I, I appreciate you using the Kinexus example of a handful of key, if you will, like indicators of organizational health. Like I, right. I like to joke, I made this joke in um, measures of success, you know, that the K in KPI, it's key performance indicators, not kajillion performance indicators, right? right. So if you look like at your own health, there are hundreds of how many different laboratory tests could you order on an individual hundreds exactly. yeah oh yeah sure sure in a hospital absolutely i mean in an emergency department i'm sure there's 20 or 30 that are in all, all of those yeah yeah so um isabel hopefully <laughs> hopefully that question our one, answers last help, but, oh. yeah, one last point then we can move i think we're having a little bit of delay in audio which is why we're talking over each other so I apologize to the listeners, yeah. but one last key, key point to, to mention, and then we can move on. I think there's probably KPIs to think about at the top organizational level, and then there are KPIs at the division level, and then depending on how big the organization is, there might be KPIs in, in, in a team level. So mm -hmm. it, there'll, there'll be this cascading, and then you can start to see how that correlates to, to kind of strategy deployment, and you can see how that correlates to catch ball to figure out, okay, what are going to be the KPIs that are going to directly you know, influence or um, positively promote the, the KPIs that are above me and, and, and whatnot. These are all, all these concepts are interrelated. They don't stop and start at any point. So um, I think that that makes it actually really easy to not worry about exactly where you're starting with doing organized improvement work. Um, it's gonna make sense for different places at different organizations. There's actually some questions related to that. It might be a good jumping off point to go to the next question. Okay, so uh, let's see. Carol asked, do you have any culture change improvement activities that you like most or believe to be effective? Um, and Greg, maybe let me bounce this to you and, and think, uh, you know, as, as CEO of a company, um, if you're trying to influence the culture in Kinexus, what, what are things that you would do as a CEO? Yeah, so what, what I, I'm gonna, I'm going to, Kind of pick apart the question because I think a couple of words in the question would make me question the question, if you will. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> questions are good questions, so I, I think it, it allows us to talk a little bit about. You know, to me, there's a culture activity. Sounds a, a little odd because to me, a culture is just a accumulation of what we do. So I love Seth Godin's definition of culture which is people like us do things like this and so to me there isn't a specific action where all of a sudden oh now we're doing a culture defining right. activity right um, and right. i say that a little bit tongue-in-cheek because we're preparing for our annual meeting um, next week and we have two blocks for culture but for us those are really just kind of fun off the wall you know at our last mid-annual we did it was either where where's kind of going to be in five years or 10 years i think it was 10 years something like you know ludicrous right. and had me partnering with elon musk and getting kinexus up in mars or something but really it was just kind of a fun activity it, it really when we're talking about what defines a culture it's what are the activities that we do on an everyday basis so then if you're saying well what defines an improvement culture it, let's say you're not doing any organized improvement work Currently, even if you're not doing organized improvement work, there's probably improvement work going on. It's just disorganized and people don't know and they don't realize they're doing it. But if you're trying to think, how do I do improvement work in an organized way using lean methodologies or Six Sigma or however you want to you know, think through that, I would think through, okay, well, 
what are the activities I want to do that will help promote that? And, and you might decide, oh, we should start with an idea board and we should huddle around that once a day or a couple times a week or figure out what kind of cadence you need to do. But then all of a sudden you're going to realize, oh, we've developed an improvement culture because we've been doing improvement work because people like us do things like this. Yeah. That's my take on the question, um, which is kind of answering but not answering it. And yeah. then I'll throw out one last thing and then I'm going to I'm going to throw the ball out to you, um, which is directly answering the question, which is I find it I found it really cool when we did a 5S event in the Austin office. Got everyone involved. We cleaned and sorted and I'm sure a you know a, a 5S expert could come in and say, "Oh, well you didn't really apply all the principles here and there, but you know, we did the best we can, and certainly at the end of where we ended up compared to the beginning of it, um, we're in a much better place. And we're doing a better job of sustaining, but we still do that activity about once a quarter and kind of figure out like, oh, there's this clutter here. What, what should we do with it? Or do we have an idea of what's going on with all of our swag or whatnot? So 5S is always a nice, a nice place to start as well. I'll toss that out. Sure. I agree with you. I think I, I don't think of culture as uh, like I don't think it, it's culture improvement activities, but I think it's it, like you said, it's more of this is how we are. But I think you have to be intentional about stating this is the type of culture that we would like to have. And you know, this is going back in time, back to 2011, 2012. Um, you and I were working together, and I know Greg, you and Matt as um, the other co-founder. Um, it talked a lot about what kind of company are you building? What do you want the culture to be? You and I talked about that a lot, about yeah. how do we set the tone and establish that we want to be an improvement culture right. as a company that's helping others <laughs> support their improvement culture. So I think there was a lot of upfront intention um, on your part and all of our parts as uh, you start hiring people and the team starts growing. And it's I think if you don't if a, if a startup leader doesn't pay any attention to that until okay now now the company is five years old and it's really growing fast and oh my gosh what do we have here right the culture right. Just, just evolved that in some ways i mean you can always course correct but it's better to try to build that culture as you go this is probably as good as any kind of glancing down the questions to to plug a book that I am reading, and of course, I, I mentioned the book, and I, I'm blanking on the author right now. You might know the author, um, Atomic Habits. Do you know James Clear. James Clear, thank you. Um, sign up for his uh, his weekly um, blog. It comes out on our weekly newsletter. It comes out on Thursdays, but it, it's it. He describes it in the book as almost a um, next version or a continuation of Charles Duhigg's The Power of Habits. And I think when we're talking about improvement activities, what we're really talking about is behavior and understanding how to change, develop, create new habits is fundamental to doing, um, to creating a personal improvement culture, but more importantly, to create an organizational improvement culture. And I read the book this past month. I rarely recommend books to my wife, who is, um, much more into fiction and um, all sorts of, I mean, she consumes books, sometimes multiple multiple books a week, and but does not do nonfiction. And I said, I said, Adrian, you need to read this book. Um, and by about chapter three, she came to me and she was like, oh my gosh, I this, this is really an interesting, almost framework of a way to think through, through habits. So that's my, my plug for uh, a book to read that I, I think will fundamentally help figure out how to do these type of activities. Yeah, and I, I, I haven't read Atomic Habits yet. There was an earlier book just a couple years ago I really love called Tiny Habits mm. by BJ Fogg. Mm. And then like you said, The Power of Habit uh, by, by Charles Duhigg. Um, so it's, I, I'd be interested to compare. I mean, Atomic sounds smaller than Tiny. I mean, like there's microscopic. I don't know. Maybe there's maybe I'll write a book called Microscopic Habits that fits in. <laughs> right. Well, I think Atomic would have that beat. I guess it would be like electrons and protons and 
Well, those are atoms. I, I, I don't know. It's, quantum. Would, would quantum. it be quantum? Quantum habits. quantum habits. Exactly. <laughs> there you go. I'm going to go get that URL right now, quantumhabits.com. <laughs> Someone's going to be a 90% percent chance that right now I could be doing this, you know? <laughs> yeah. All right. So we have uh, a question from uh, Lynn who's asked questions before. So thank you for that. Um, what what um, improvement or problem solving methods are more efficient for the beginning of the improvement journey? Lean, Six Sigma, Demaic? Say that is that's six sigma uh, design thinking. I, I don't really know this methodology. I've heard of it. It's it's an it's spelled uh, in all caps T R I Z, and I've heard it pronounced as trees or what else. Um, so I think you know my thoughts here. I, I would think about. I mean, I don't know how you define efficient. Um, sometimes effective problem solving is not really efficient because it's iterative. Right. It, right. It's plan, do, study, adjust cycles. But I, I would think maybe about what's simple to get started with baby steps, and maybe these are tiny habits or atomic habits, of start small, small Kaizens. Don't ask everyone to dream up a million dollar cost savings or a big giant innovation. Start with fixing something small within your uh, span of work, uh, make your work easier. This is all the Kaizen stuff <laughs> that we've talked about in YouTube videos and, and all, but I, I would encourage starting small. I think the fear, uh, or I've seen this in practice, if you choose a problem solving model that's too complicated for the, for the need, it can scare people off and then they're not participating. Um, I give a lot of credit to Pascal Dennis, who I've learned a lot from. He's a former Toyota person from Ontario, um, Canada. And he always says, you know, you, you've got to choose the simplest problem solving model for the job. And, and, and I think there are a lot of um, good examples, customers of ours, and people have talked in webinars about when do you do simple Kaizen? When do you do an A3? When do you do a Kaizen event? I would say don't don't choose something more complicated than is necessary. Greg? And I think if you're if you're getting into increased complexity, I would even argue that a Kaizen event is 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 pretty complicated. I think if you're going to do one, I would do one with an expert um, by your side or with the team doing that. So I think I think I'll just tell a story about about learning how to play the guitar. I think that's probably the most uh, applicable way to answer this, uh, based on your answer, or not applicable, but but different way of thinking through it. To me, I when I turned 40, I was like, hey, I, I've always wanted to learn how to play the guitar. If I'm not going to if I'm not going to actually just do this, I'm I'm never going to do it. There's never going to be a good time to do it. And so I had tried at least two or three times in earnest in my life to to, to play the guitar. And to me, the, the biggest thing is not getting bogged down with theory and worrying about if your fingers are in the right place. And just it's just the, the quickest way to make sure you're going to develop a habit and, and actually learn how to play the guitar is just learn the three chords that you can play, you know, your, your, your G, A and D or G, you know, and D and Definitely don't start with an F, but you get the idea. Three easy chords, hmm. and, and then just actually play a song where you have a little fun doing it, and then build on another song and another song. And, and, and after you, if, if, you, if you're just going to do that and, and have a little fun doing it and aren't going to get bogged down with theory and technical and this and that, then you actually build up a little bit of enjoyment. So, so how do I apply this to, to, to improvement? If you're trying to figure out, okay, I want to do bottom-up improvement, meaning I want to get everyone at the front line engaged in doing this, don't bog them down with like being hypercritical on how they solved a problem. Celebrate that they identified a problem and attempted to solve it. And then over time, in two or three years, you'll look at the problem-solving capacity and IQ of that person or that team and go, oh my gosh, can you imagine what we were doing three years ago? How wrong we did all that stuff. But but guess what? You know, now I've been playing guitar for five, six years, and you know, I got 140 songs in my songbook that I'm not gonna blow anyone away, but you know, we can have a good side good good campfire side and have a good session. And I'm actually now really ready to take some lessons and to get into some theory and to really advance what I'm doing. And so to me, I wrote down to, to prep for this, I wrote down the KISS method. Keep it simple, stupid. Just get people engaged, get people 
creating the habit of, of identifying something and trying to work on something and and slowly don't bog people down otherwise they're going to lose interest and 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 you've lost the opportunity yeah yeah and i and I'm, I'm i'm just picking on you but yeah i know that expression is uh you know keep it simple stupid um i'm like oh, i don't want to call people stupid so we, we maybe we can I mean, we, we, we could say like, keep it simple seriously or something. Right, right, yeah, 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 that's true. Keep Stupid it simple, is, dot, 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 serious. It does create the kiss, you know. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> or, or it could just be kiss without the second S. It could just be keep it simple. Yeah, keep it simple, silly. <laughs> silly, there you go. But when you talk about having fun or silly or having fun, I think that's one of the keys. When you talk about guitar and doing something that creates positive reinforcement for what, why the effort is worthwhile. Um, I've heard people say the same thing about Kaizen. Um, I, again, I'll give credit to Pascal Dennis um, of, you know, that Kaizen should have um, at times a playful spirit were the words he would use. Right. There's a lot of that in Japan, Japanese culture in general. It's really serious, but there's this playful side to the culture. Um, I've seen this in American hospitals. Uh, Joe Schwartz and his team at Franciscan, they really try to especially make the celebrations and the positive call outs fun when they're, when somebody's complaining about somebody, something, not somebody, something. And somebody will say with a smile, Hey, that's a Kaizen. Like they, there's this positive joy um, in what they're doing. Like why well, I, I tried, I, I made a half hearted attempt to uh, learn golf mm. um, almost 20 years ago. I wasn't getting any enjoyment out of it. I enjoyed hanging out with my one friend that I'd go to the par three course with. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm like, yeah, this isn't for me. Unlike what you saw with your guitar experience. So maybe I went about it the wrong way. Maybe golf just isn't for me. Yeah. Or you shouldn't have gone to a course initially. Go, go to a driving range and, and yeah. figure that out. Go putt or, you know, start with, you know, something that's that you can do. Because my muse this morning, we, we like to do muses um, when we start our, our Friday uh, stand up. It was um, growth happens at edges. So you're, it's not going to happen in your comfort zone. But if you go way past your edge, th then you're not going to grow at all also. Right? I mean, they, yeah. they talked a little bit about that in Atomic Compact. That you have to go, you just push yourself just a little bit, just that 1% or 2%, and then you can kind of create a new normal. Jumping in and, I mean, trying to play, you know, Hotel California as your first song, no, not not the not the right idea. It's got too many weird chords, and then to really play it like the way the Eagles play it. Oh my gosh! I mean, yeah. Start with Dylan. Starts. Is that simpler? I wouldn't have thought. I don't. I don't. Oh, I don't know has, he has so many just like super simple, fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but no, no, that's not to say he's he's he's. All of his songs are just incredibly simple, but there's there's a bunch of, of, of three chord places to start in rock and roll that um, yeah. get you, get you on, off the ground and running. And I, and I think the just do it's are probably a great place to start if you're doing kind of the bottom up um, concept. So. Okay. Well, hey, I, let's try to uh, fit in two more questions here um, for the half hours up. Here's one from, I, Hi, Hi Liana. I hope I'm saying um, that correctly is a good question here as well. How can we defeat silos? That was the language used. How do we defeat silos in an organization with interrelated departmental functions to attain synchronicity and service delivery, especially with lean healthcare initiatives? Um, so I, I'll, I'll throw some thought out there, uh, out there. First, I, I think sort of like what you were saying about, uh, we were talking about culture, I, and I think you have to work at it. I think you have to be intentional about saying, we are going to break down silos, which is a key lesson from uh, Toyota and Lean. It's a key lesson going back to Dr. Deming. Don't um, encourage, and, and I'm sure part, part of the background of the question is, you know, we're trying to fight against sub-optimization. We're well-intended things in one silo that cause problems for the system as a whole. So one thing I've seen that's, that's really effective, two things kind of related. One is if you go through and do um, a value stream mapping activity and get participation from mm. people from each of those silos, I, I, I would predict, if not guarantee, nobody could map the entire end-to-end -end value stream. But when you get everyone together and they're learning about the bigger system, they're discovering assumptions that had been incorrect, disconnects, things like that, 
The only thing that's really helpful is to actually go and walk the value stream. And I've seen this, like for example, emergency department staff and laboratory staff. There's a lot of tendency to blame each other mm -hmm. for, pro okay. for process problems. Where's my um, INR? Yeah. What? Where's my INR? One of the lab tests that notoriously takes a long time for some reason. Yeah. But I'm thinking of like the example where the lab blames ED for not properly labeling the tubes. The labels aren't vertical enough. And the ED thinks the lab is just anal retentive about the verticality. And then you go and walk, walk the process. And for one, the lab might get a better appreciation for how hectic the ER can be. And then the ER people get a, a better appreciation of like, oh, here's how the laboratory automation works and there's barcode scanners and if that label's not almost perfectly vertical the equipment doesn't scan it and then if the lab has to relabel it now those extra labels run the, the the risk of jamming up the equipment so you could say well maybe the root cause is the equipment needs to be <laughs> more robust but i've seen things like that help break down the finger pointing and, and and help people gain a better appreciation for how they can help others in the value stream yeah i'm, I'm thinking cross training um, a little bit. I don't think you have to go as far as that. I mean, just walk walk alongside the footsteps for 20 minutes of somebody. And that would be like the first step of cross training. I'm also thinking we, we've started some some projects where we call them tiger team. I think it's a pretty normal um, yeah. uh, a term for that in business where we've tried to get a couple of different people from, from different divisions at Kinexus to work on where we're developing an idea of putting together a swag box for our new customers so they can get some kind of Kinexus paraphernalia. And we just thought, oh, that's a great, but we got the development team and marketing and, and sales and customer experience. And they're, they're kind of working on that. And then I also think that just some good old, you know, I don't want to say team building exercise, but just getting to know people, like some kind of social activity because once you meet people that are on the yeah. other side of Kylo, you develop empathy for them. It's like, oh, Mark, yeah, we met at the thing, Majig, with da, 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 yeah. Yeah. how's it going? And as soon as, like, when you're calling up the lab and, you, and you've actually met the person on the other line, you're going to, it's a whole different conversation. Just cause There's no, I mean, really to truly have empathy, I think, you know, understanding the other person's a human and, and knowing the person um, goes a long way, so. That was a bit of a, uh, the video fritzed out. Hopefully that doesn't affect the uh, affect the recording. I've got to figure out, by the way, uh, a root cause or a more effective countermeasure when I'm doing webinars or stuff from this physical location, the internet is fast enough, but it's not consistent enough. So yeah, um, we'll find out. We will, we will see. Um, but yeah, I just want to amplify your point, Greg. Um, it's so much easier to blame the nameless, faceless jerks in that other department. Right. And you make all sorts of assumptions about them, or I've seen that. I, I try not to do that, but I've seen people do that. And like you said, get to know each other, even if it's not socially, like a value stream mapping event can have some element of a, hey, let's get to know. Um, so, uh, last question, we might run over a couple of minutes. I think that's uh, fine. Um, if anyone has to jump off, the recording, of course, will be available. But we have a customer question. This is from Josh. Um, and I think this might be more related to um, Kinex's software. Um, what use cases are available to provide insight into adoption? And you have curriculum to help onboard new people. Um, I, I, I think he's asking about the adoption and onboarding related to Kinexus. So Greg, can I, let me throw that to you. And I will, I thought we were gonna, you, you skipped over one, so I wasn't ready for this one. So hold on, what use cases are Okay, sorry. And, and are we talking? You think this is use cases that can be modeled in Kinexus and then curriculum to onboard new customers versus new employees because we're in the process of like adding a bunch of people to the team. So I'm thinking of a complete. Yeah, no, I think I think it's from their customer perspective is they're adding more users within their organization. So you use cases around different ways of using Kinexus. So if when when mark was alluding to some of our original conversations back in 2011 or so that we only had one use case it was all bottom up and then as as time evolved and we started talking to people that do continuous improvement we realized that continuous improvement is more than just bottom up i mean there there are top down larger 
whether they're events or whether they're more traditional projects, hopefully they're not really, really long and complex, but they're shorter in cycle. And, um, and, and, then, and then we started to uh, interact with people that, that wanted also to do strategy deployment in Kinexus. And so really, the, the, I think those are the, the three main, whether it's a bottom up work, whether that's being done at a team level or a department level, or whether that's being done with opportunities for improvements or just do it or, or small personal A3s, then there's the top down, whether that's a lean project or more kind of formal DMAIC or PDSA, but it's just more people, more complex, higher risk um, situation. All those can be managed in Kinexus. And, and then and then the strategy deployment, how, do, how does everything align in, in the work? Um, so I think that's probably the easiest way to describe the main use cases of doing the improvement work. But then we also have um, the capabilities to uh, to do all of your, your KPI work, right? So your all your charting, um, obviously we, uh, we love control charts. In fact, we just did a major release to include the, the top three rules that Mark talks about in his um, um, in his most recent book, uh, Measures of Success, where now we can kind of automate and, and flag and give people notifications when it's a signal versus a static. Um, so so really, we feel like you can you can manage all of the major activities that folks are doing in in um, continuous improvement um, work, and um, we. To even extend beyond that, we have people that will, will use Kinexus to help facilitate them running um, their classes, whether they're doing a you know a belted class or an A3 class or a certain kind of problem solving class. So certainly our website is going to be a, a great resource there to take a look at. And then to answer, um, do we have a curriculum to help onboard new people? Absolutely. You go through an entire onboarding um, process at the highest level. You, you initially kind of go through a discovery process to figure out what are your primary goals for the for the, um, the implementation and your first kind of use cases of Kinexus, go through a little bit of a, kind of increasing your Kinexus IQ of you know, what, what are templates and boards and reports and charts and things like that. And then you go through a really pretty deep dive where you we, we map your organization, we map all of the individual improvement workflows that you're gonna go through. We call this, we refer to this as Kinexus Core. Then you come out of that with some personalized training that's training just for your organization and then you finalize that with a um with a, a deployment and of course there's there's an, an, an endless stream of office hours and new version education and um just a lot of different ways to kind of continue that continuing education there so tough question to answer briefly hopefully i touched on the things there and and what resources like if they're a customer they should how, how should they reach out uh, or if people in, in general have interest, um, they take a look at our website. Yeah, take a look at our website. We have a customer blog. That's a great way to um, take a look. If you're a customer, it's really focused there. We have a regular blog. Obviously, if you're interested in taking a deeper dive, just, just hit the contact me or schedule a demo or something along those lines. And um, if you're a customer, um, you if you're one of the champions and you have direct access to your your own account manager. And of course you have a, a pretty rich support site as well. So lots of different ways to interact with us, whether you're inside the application and kind of moving through there or you're you're on our, our regular kinexus.com website as well. So, yeah. All right, so, oh gosh, we are a little bit over and we're out of time. We've got the backlog. We'll, we'll try to do another one in a, a month or two, right? Great. I love it. So uh, I want to thank everybody for attending or, or for watching uh, the recording. You can, of course, get the other 25 episodes through our YouTube channel. It's probably the best way to find those. You can get the audio of all of these through the Kinexus podcast series. Um, so with that, I'll let you close it out, Greg. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. And I always like to remind everyone that there's no better day than today to start or spread or sustain your continuous improvement efforts. So we'll see you kind of next time. See you kind of next time. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> see you, Greg.